Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this live webinar that is being organized as part of the tech session powered by SpringPod. Whether you're just getting started with the program or you've been cracking on with it already, we hope you're enjoying it. Don't forget, if you've got any questions or need support from a member of our team, you can use the green chat icon in the bottom right corner of the platform. Now, if you haven't joined one of these webinars yet, or you might not know already, then this talk should last between about 30 to 40 minutes. Please use the Q&A function to ask our guest questions. He'd love to answer them and he's here to help to make the most of his time. But due to the amount of questions we tend to get through, we may not be able to answer them all. So please use the upvote function if you spot a question that you're going to ask anyway. And we'll be choosing from the most top voted questions. It's the little thumbs up underneath, so give that a click if it's a question you wanted to ask. If you need to leave halfway through, then don't worry because this webinar is being recorded and we aim to have it up within about 24 hours of it being recorded. So you can come back and watch it whenever you need. In today's webinar, we're going to be joined by Hugh Shields, the Technical Director of Huawei. So he's going to introduce himself. So Hugh, over to you. Thank you very much, Chloe. And um, well, welcome, everybody. It's a great pleasure to be talk this afternoon. Um, I also claim I'm a futurist as well, so my, my career in accounting has moved in different directions. Uh, and that's one of the beauties of accounting, it actually gives you so many options uh, in life. And uh, I'll be talking about some of, the, some of the, my journey, some of the stories. Um, just quickly uh, to, to talk about some of the things that you see on this slide. Um, firstly, at the bottom left-hand corner, I'm a member of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of Scotland. It's the oldest uh, body of accountants in the world. Uh, it was uh, created in 1854. So it's the, as I say, the oldest out there. Uh, I also, uh, apart from working for Huawei, I have a board role at something called the Value Reporting Foundation. Um, that won't mean a lot to you. What might mean something to you is something called ESG, which is standing for Environment, Social and Governance. It includes things like climate change and all the things that we worry about at, at the moment. And that, that board function is looking specifically at how you manage these risks. And then recently, and what I'm very happy about, uh, you can see in the middle there, the Center for Research into AI and Mankind, uh, something I formed, I founded this think tank just last week, in fact. Um, and we're going to touch on AI as we go through, because AI, artificial intelligence, I'm sure you all know, um, is going to have a big bearing on accounting. And when you're thinking about what you're going to do going forward, it's definitely worth thinking about the impact that AI will have on your futures. So if you go to the next slide, please, uh, Harvey. So here's a uh, sample of the various companies I have worked for. Um, KPM firm of accountants, this is who I first uh, trained with and qualified as an accountant. Um, I was very fortunate. My first boss was somebody called Douglas Flint. He went on to become chairman of HSBC, the bank. Uh, so a very influential guy and somebody who's helped me a lot in my career. Um, after I left uh, KPMG, I went to work for Mobile Oil. You can see Mobile Oil on the right-hand side. They're not at Mobile Oil now. They're now Exxon Mobil, one of the very largest companies in the world. Uh, even at that time, Mobil was about the 10th largest company. So a very, very big company. And I'm going to tell you some of the stories uh, that I experienced at Mobil because my first Mobil was a 100% worldwide traveling audit job. I spent two years on the road, um, worked in 20 different countries. The second year I spent entirely in French-speaking Africa. And just amazing experiences. Um, so this is one of the things about accounting. It will open the doors uh, to all sorts of different countries. Accounting is not country-specific these days. Accounting is very much something that we have a common language. We have international standards of accounting and different countries are doing basically the same stuff. So we have a, an, an ability to be highly mobile as accountants. Then um, after I worked at Mobile Oil, I, I went over with my wife to the Middle East. You can see that town corner, the Central Bank of Oman. I'll talk a little bit about Oman in a moment. Oman is a spectacular country in the, in the Arabian Gulf, um, a country with many historic links to the UK and uh, a fascinating time we did have. And then the last one I mentioned here um, is Barclays Capital. Uh, I spent uh, nine years at Barclays Capital. That was the investment banking arm of Barclays. And uh, I'm going to spend a few minutes telling you about uh, what went on at Barclays Capital. So let's just move on to the next slide, please, uh, Harvey. So why have I 
got the this uh, the amazing San Francisco. Well, my first ever overseas posting, and this was still while I was at was indeed to San Francisco. And um, we had quite an interesting assignment. We had a client who had developed um, something called the MRI machine. Some of you might have heard of MRI. It stands for Magnetic Resonance Imaging. It's really clever stuff. It, it, it basically, uh, it's like a fancy x-ray. The way it works is it causes, um, it causes tissue inside your body to oscillate at different frequencies. And those different frequencies, they can translate into different colors and they can fight, figure out what's going on inside you. Um, so our, what we were trying to do though, we were, because our clients had developed the MRI machine, they'd taken the patent, they developed the prototype with the inventor. They then licensed this prototype to various companies. When you license uh, prototypes like that, you get royalties back. And they wanted us to check whether the royalties they were getting back uh, were actually complete and, and uh, accurate and so forth. And so we got sent out to San Francisco to do this, this checking work. And we, we were out there for two weeks. Um, I had an interesting experience there. I was, uh, I was with an Indian lady. We were working hard all week. We worked hard up until Saturday night. And then I said to Kalyana, you know, it's San Francisco, it's Saturday night. We really should go out. And Kalyana said, oh, I'm not so sure about that. And I said to Kalyani, oh, well, you know, you only live once. Now, Kalyani being, uh, uh, being religious and her particular Indian religion, and she looked at me and said, well, no, you don't. <laughs> so anyway, nonetheless, we did make it. Uh, and we had a great time. And it was a great, a great way to, to start my overseas work. Uh, next slide, please, uh, Harvey. Now, I'm not sure if you guys know who this is, but this, this guy uh, died not so long ago. A guy called President Mobutu of, of, was there. Then, uh, a country called Zaire is now the Democratic I spent three months of uh, what was then Zaire. And uh, this is in 1994. The country was in a lot of difficulties. So uh, this is when I was working for Mobile Oil and uh, I was doing my audits. Uh, but the country was at 50% inflation per month. If you compound up 50% per month, it's 20,000% a year. The, uh, the highest denomination that we had uh, was 10 US cents. Inflation was completely out of control. The currency was out of control. And uh, when we came to pay our hotel bills every month, we literally had uh, an entire hold all of currency to, to, pay, to pay the hotel. The, uh, the, actual, the actual banking system had completely collapsed. There were no banking cards, no nothing. Uh, the country was so dangerous that we had bodyguards everywhere we went. And um, I actually, uh, despite having boss for most of the time, managed to get myself kidnapped at a certain point. Uh, I was held at gunpoint for three hours. So that was a quite, a, uh, quite an interesting experience I had in Zaire. But yeah, that is what they were really after. Uh, I was kidnapped in one of the local airports. They were just after money. And uh, so the mobile sent around their, their guy with the money and they asked how much you want for Mr. Shields? And they said 400 US dollars. I was thinking that must be worth more than that. But anyway, 400 dollars was, was what they settled at, and uh, I was set free. So that was that was my excitement for that morning. Uh, next slide, please, uh, Harvey. Now here we are in Oman. This is um, at the time one of the um, is probably not quite the top hotel now in in Oman. This is Muscat. In Oman. It's called Alvastan. It's actually personally owned by the Sultan of Oman himself. Um, when I interviews, uh, they put me in this hotel for the weekend, and I thought this is pretty good. When you walk into the, you know, it's a bit like walking onto a James Bond film set. I think it's just stunning, stunning hotel, and you can see, um, you can see the private beach they have. The hotel, it's. Uh, it's it's really spectacular place. Well, I was working for the Saint uh, of Oman, and so um, in, in in that sense, my ultimate boss was in fact the Sultan. Although uh, there were two people in between, um, it's a really interesting country. I don't know if you've, anybody's been out that way, but if you get a chance to go to Oman, it is a beautiful country. Um, it is it's a very mixed country of, of terrain. It's partly mountainous, it's partly desert, 
Um, they even have a monsoon season down in the south, so it's almost like a tropical rain belt. Um, fascinating place. I was out there working. I was help, helping train the locals uh, in the ways of accounting. Um, I also helped the bank uh, implement some accounting systems. Uh, I was there for two years, and it was it was a lot of fun. Um, if you like the sunshine, it's a good place to be because basically there's every single day in Oman. The difference is that in the winter is a perfect temperature. So from maybe October to March, it's 28 degrees every day. Beautiful, beautiful weather. And then it's like somebody hit a switch and from April through to September, it's more like 45 degrees. Uh, it's incredibly hot. And um, you don't really want to be outdoors. Uh, in in the Oman summer, so it's yeah as I said, in the summer, but um, yeah, great time in Oman. I think uh, I learned a lot. You know, when you go, have the opportunity to work in other countries, try and experience the culture, try and learn a little bit about the language, um, try and learn a little bit about you know the history of the place. We actually in in this, this country in the UK, we have a long and uh, rich history with Oman, um, and. Uh, Actually, a lot of the a lot of our special forces do their tra training out there in the desert. Ex special forces uh, soldiers are doing security jobs in Oman, so you can you can meet some interesting characters out there. Um, but as I say I, I really recommend uh, even if you just go on holiday there, it's, it's great. But as I say, from an accounting point of view, it's a great chance to uh, to get out and, and see the world. Uh, next slide, please. Now, this is a guy called Bob Diamond, uh, uh, an American go-getting investment banker. Um, he was in charge of Barclays Capital, the investment bank of Barclays, when I was there. Um, extremely ambitious man. Um, and in fact, Barclays Capital did incredibly well while I was there. I mean, when I joined, we had 2,000 staff. And when I left, we had nearly 20,000 staff. So that was a period of maybe eight or nine years. So we grew incredibly, incredibly quickly. And um, it was a very successful time up until the credit crisis. I mean, some of you may remember the credit crisis hitting the economy in, in late 2008, 2009. It was a period of immense stress for Barclays. Um, and I was, I was in there you know, trying to help. Um, the big thing that I tried to do was to raise enough money that we didn't have to either go to the government for a bailout or rely on uh, current shareholders for money. In the end, we were able to raise money in the Middle East. Um, uh, so it was a little bit controversial because of the terms, but it enabled Barclays to continue without uh, government uh, support. And you will remember, I expect, or some number of banks had to have government support in order to survive. So it was a really spicy time to be working in, in banking. Um, I had joined Barclays Capital to set up a technical accounting team in uh, the banks and certainly in the investment banks where some of the transactions are very complex. The accounting is also very complex. So uh, uh, you have to really pay attention to what you're doing. Um, and you know, it was, it was uh, as I say, quite a special time during that credit crisis period. But we got through it. And uh, it, uh, it, it was through a, a lot of efforts from a lot of people coming together uh, as a team. Uh, next slide, please. What I'm trying to say here, you know, what are all the different ingredients uh, that go into being an accountant? And um, I would say many of these, I mean, these qualities are things that will take to a successful career anywhere. So I'm not just accounting. I would say one of the first things one should have is enthusiasm. And you see this in the, in the top right hand corner. Um, enthusiasm is infectious. If people, if you're running a team, you want enthusiastic people on your team. You want people who uh, are going to smile in the morning, light the room up a little bit, um, and you know, bring a sense of purpose to what you're doing. So I think enthusiasm is, is a big thing. And I think having a sense of humor really, really helps as well. Uh, you know, not everything goes, goes completely fine in life. You're going to have trouble. But if you can see the 
funny side of it and uh, good because uh, you know life is too short one should try to see one should try to see the, the, the things um, of course there's an account you see there at the top I've got a calculator in actual fact I mean a lot of people would say as an accountant you need lots of maths you don't really the maths is actually relatively simple um, and computers are doing it anyway so it's not it's not that you need lots and lots of maths by any means what you do need is an accounting is this word judgment um, a lot of accounting issues when we look at things and we look at difficult topics like how much should we be providing for bad debts or how much is this litigation going to cost us or how much revenue are we forecasting for this year these are all things which involve judgments and um, so you, you one of the things is accounting is not a science I guess a lot of people would say when you, when you look at a set of companies accounts you think well these numbers are hard and fast well they're actually not they tend to involve a lot of judgments and they are um, in statistical terms, the numbers you find in financial statements, they're like point estimates in a range. So we could have chosen different numbers. Um, so there's a lot of, there's a lot of um, judgment going to, to finalizing things. Um, another big thing is, is working hard. I, I don't say these slides, but I write books as well. I've written eight books. Um, one of the books that I'll be shortly publishing is a, an imaginary conversation between Thomas Edison, um, he of the light bulb fame, and Henry Ford, the founder of the Ford Motor Company. Um, it's an imaginary dinner conversation between them, and it's, it's going to be called Success on a Plate. And it's basically their formula for success in the workplace. And the thing they keep coming back to again and again and again, work hard, never give up. And this is, this is great advice for anybody in their careers. If you work hard and you never give up, eventually you will find the answer. And Thomas Edison famously said, well, he, he experimented thousands of times in order to get the light bulb to work. Um, every time he got a failure, he didn't see it as a failure. He saw it as one, uh, eliminating one possibility from what he had to do. So, uh, and, and he often, well, you know, people often do give up just at the point when they're gonna succeed. So that's a really good piece of advice. Just never, never give up. Keep going, keep going, keep going. And uh, I, would, I would strongly uh, recommend that. We have the, uh, at the bottom there, we've got, uh, like they're having a happy team meeting. And I think that, uh, you know, being, part of a team and being part of a successful team is also a really important quality what you should look for when you when you're joining any job not just you know, any not just accounting um one of the jobs i had i mean i didn't mention this bank before but one of the jobs i had i worked at credit suisse which is another uh, another bank a swiss bank and they had in their appraisal system a thing which was very interesting i thought that they would always appraise you or assess you specifically on the teamwork and whatever score you got on the teamwork would set the maximum score you could get in your overall appraisal. So let's say A is the top score and D is the bottom score. And if you got a D on the teamwork, that would be the D you get for your overall appraisal, even if you got A's for everything else. So you're really pushing people to say, it's not all about you. It is all about uh, getting together as a team. And... Um, uh, you know, Chloe mentioned at the moment my role. I work as technical director at Huawei, the famous uh, Chinese telecoms company, biggest telecoms company in the world. The Chinese culture is very much about team. Um, if a project is failing, it's not because of an individual uh, the way they see it. It's very much the team is failing. The team needs to come together. A team needs to deliver the project. And I like this philosophy because it's it's uh, uh, it, it really does encourage and motivate people to come together and to deliver their best as that team and you know um what two three four five six people is always better than one person however brilliant that one person is so we're always trying to get teams to work well together and i think the flip side of that is if you if you get in your careers to being a team leader uh or or a, you know a manager or whatever you also need to think about how you're going to bring that team together. And, and a, a good leader, a good manager is treating every person as an individual. Every person has got slightly different strengths, slightly different qualities. They're going to be motivated in different ways. So as that team leader, 
Uh, what you're trying to do is bring the very best out of that individual. And um, I was once given two very good questions, two very interesting questions, which, which I've always taken with me and you know, think about these um, to try to figure out how you improve someone's performance. And the two questions are, on a scale of one to 10, how much do you enjoy your job? And the other question is, on a scale of one to 10, how close do you think you are to your maximum potential? Now, if you get on, it's interesting that people generally quickly give the answer to those questions. They will say, well, I'm a six in terms of how much I enjoy it, or I'm a three in terms of how close I am to my potential. Then you can explore what is in their minds, why they think they're six, why they think they're three. And then you can start to look at how you bring those, those uh, numbers back to something a little bit higher up the, up the spectrum. Um, the interesting one, of course, is performance. Is If you ask somebody about their best performance, it's a very difficult question because none of us know what our top performance is. Um, I tend to think, though, that we can always do a little bit better and um, we can always try to think positively and uh, give up this, uh, take this positive mindset into what we do to tr try to get to our performance. It's interesting that if you ever ask an Olympic gold medalist, why did they win Olympic gold? They never talk about physical qualities. They never say, well, I've got stronger legs or faster legs or a bigger heart or bigger lungs or whatever. They always talk about mindset. They all say they wanted it more. And that kind of thinking you know, is just as relevant in the workplace as it is in the sporting arena. It's all about mindset and having a positive, strong mindset will take you far, far, far in your career. Uh, and, and it's worth really trying to develop that strong mindset uh, as you go through. But I'm just going to talk about artificial intelligence because in your careers and in your lifetimes, AI is going to be huge. And it's worth thinking about AI as you go thinking about what you're going to do and how you're going to uh, enter the workplace. It may be that, you know, people talk about something called the singularity. The singularity is when uh, we have something called artificial general intelligence. It means when the robots have got to a point where they actually exceed humans in their ability to do things. Uh, now, this is a potentially quite scary world, and this is why I founded this think tank. So my think tank, the Center for Research into AI and Mankind, what we're trying to do is we are trying to figure out how we optimize human use of artificial intelligence. Um, is it going to be the case that machines are going to do everything? If so, what are, what are humans going to do? Um, is it the case that if we don't control it properly, the machines actually take over? Or how's it going to look? I mean, Elon Musk is already developing brain implants. I don't know if you heard about this, but he's already um, um, implants into pigs' brains to supercharge their brains. You know, are we all going to become cyborgs or kind of super superhumans? All of this stuff needs managing, and it's quite complicated. But my best advice would be, you know, thinking, think about AI, get yourself up to speed on AI um, when you have a chance. I think the real value in AI in terms of being in the workplace is thinking of ways in which it can be effectively used. Um, yeah, there's a programming piece to it, of course, um, but you know, there are lots of programmers out there. The real value comes in, how can I use artificial intelligence to do certain things? Um, one of the projects I'm working on at Huawei, which I'm, I'm just about to start, and I'm developing an AI-assisted uh, forecasting model. So this model will be vastly superior to anything a human could do because it will just draw on so many more variables, so many more inputs, and it will be much faster. So uh, the AI is giving a much better solution than any human solution. It's almost like, you, you know, it's almost like having 100 people working on a single forecast, something like that. So... As I say, think about AI. AI is going to be ubiquitous. It goes across everything. It goes across accounting. It goes across law. It's into medicine. Um, it will have, you know, a really, really very big effect. And I think, you know, it's worthwhile thinking to yourselves as you set off on your career, how am I going to be best placed to manage the consequences of AI? Um, in, in narrow spheres, AI is already exceeding man's capacity so you might have heard 
uh, you know, Google have a subsidiary called DeepMind, and they developed a um, a machine which could, could play the Chinese game Go. And they set this thing playing the world champion in Go, and the machine beat the world champion. And it made moves that everybody who plays Go found just completely baffling. But the thing won. And then after this machine had won, they set this machine against another machine, and they got even to higher levels between the two machines. So in very narrow spheres, the machines are already doing better than the humans. So we have to think about that. How are we going to manage that? What does it mean for our careers? So anyway, my advice is um, think about AI. Try to learn some skills about AI. Think about a little bit the, the philosophy of AI. And um, you will serve yourself well if you get some skills in that sphere. Well, the last thing I want to talk about on this slide is the one right in the middle, um, core values, ethics, integrity, principles. Um, you know, everything we do in our jobs, we should carry with principles and we should, uh, we should be able to look at ourselves in the mirror every day and say, I did the right thing. Um, in banking, and certainly, you know, when I was in investment banking, certainly would see some difficult decisions and some decisions which you would might feel uh, you're not complete with. But, you know, whatever decisions are made around you, you should always be able to look at yourself in the mirror at the end of the day and say, did I do the right thing? Did I, uh, if I felt was a problem, did I flag it? Uh, did I tell my boss? Uh, did I, you know, really be ethical in what I do uh, or what I've done? And so I would certainly very much encourage you always to bring your ethics. I think many of the qualities on this slide have a sense of humor, be enthusiastic, work hard, never give up, be ethical. These are all things that you can carry into any job, not just accounting. Um, I, think, I think the ethical piece right now is very important in accounting. We've had some, some, some scandals, some, some problems. So it becomes very important right now, but it's important in any career. So try to think about that. Uh, and then next slide, please. Um, this is, I think I'm trying to say here, you know, when you, when you ask, um, uh, what kind of skills do I need and should I go into accounting? It's like, how long is a piece of string? I think the beauty of accounting is you could do it as a baseline qualification. Maybe it's a full, full charting qualification. Maybe it's a degree. Uh, maybe it's not a full scale qualification, but maybe, you know, you can do one year uh, courses in accounting. It gives you options at the end. And it opens up the world. As I, as I mentioned, you know, I've worked in many, many countries in my career because accounting has no borders. I've touched on the fact that uh, we have international standards these days. So there are no borders in accounting. So it, in that respect, it's, it's definitely worth considering. I think that's probably the end. Next slide, please, uh, Harvey. Yeah, I mean, I think this is, this is me just recapping on the fact that um, I've, I've worked in all these different countries. Um, I think I've worked probably in around 25, 30 countries in my, in my career. Some of those are very short hops. Um, I, I spent some very short periods of time in some African countries. I was two years in the Middle East, though. Yeah, I, I, I as I say, I worked in a number of different countries. So, I'm an accountant. I think that's probably the last one. If, next slide, please. Yeah, that's it. So I think any, if there are any time for questions. Great. I think, Chloe. Uh, yes, thank you so much for that amazing presentation, Hugh. It's great to hear how accountancy has taken you all around the world and where you think it's going and how you think AI is going to be so important. So thank you for that presentation. We do have some questions coming in, so we're going to answer a few of those quickly now before the time is up. So the first question, I know you just said, um, you know, there's a, how long's a piece of string, but is there things that um, students, particularly in year 12, that sort of age, can be doing right now to get in a, the best position to get into accountancy? I think that, uh... Uh, you know, the best you can always do is try to get uh, uh, like a holiday job or something like that, um, maybe an internship. You know, those, those the accounting firms 
do open up in the summer season and mm. um, well, especially in the summer season. And I think that's a chance that is worth taking. You, you just get a chance to find out what it's like being in an office. And uh, I, I did that in my, you know, when I was a student, um, I did uh, a number of stints in the summer holidays and it just gave you a chance to find out what it's like. Um, I would say quite scary when you were a student going into an office for the first yeah. time it could be a little scary, but you know, you've got to start somewhere. So I think that's what I would suggest. Try and get into some office experience. Yeah, great. Thank you. And you mentioned that you, um, it's not all about maths, actually. A lot of people think that originally, but is it important to have a high grade in maths while at school, do you think, to have a basis there? Uh, you know, I don't think it really is. I mean, uh, I, well, I think you don't want to be, you don't, you don't need an A-level. I mean, I know people who did history degrees, English degrees, whatever, became qualified accountants. Mm. You need like a certain baseline, um, GCSE or, or whatever, we, whatever we call them uh, these days, O-levels. I did um, the baseline, but it, it, it's not complicated maths. It really isn't. It's a lot of it's just adding and subtracting. It's, it's not a lot more than that, frankly. So don't worry about the maths. They don't have high, you know, A level or whatever. It's not going to. Great, thank you. And you touched on there about your friends that have had different degrees and then have moved into accountancy. And in your presentation, you also mentioned that there's different levels. You know, you can do a one year course, you can do a degree. Um, there's lots of questions, so I'm going to kind of pull them together um, about degrees, whether there's um, a specific degree you should have, if there are other degrees you can do, what qualifications do you need to be a chartered accountant? Can you sort of tie that in as one? Are there any that you recommend or? A yeah, well, this is thing. So when, when I, um, I think right now, you can become a chartered accountant really degree at all. It wasn't the case when I was studying. It's not mm. Institute of Chartered Accountants in Scotland. You had to have either a degree or a postgraduate diploma. I just graduate one year diploma uh, in <laughs> Edinburgh, uh, and that mm -hmm. allowed me to get into the Institute programme. Um, I found that one year degree, one year postgrad course quite helpful because it's an idea of what the accountant was about, enabled me to make a decision. So we're talking about, you know, you could do a one year course, see whether you like it or not. It's not about accounting, you don't want to do it. Um, so doing the one year course, um, it's not necessary to have a degree these days to become an accountant. Um, I think it's probably true that if you do a degree you're in a better position I mean that's always you know, has to be true but it's not a necessity so if you want to go on the history or English or whatever um, one should do so my I mean if you if, if you're choosing a degree I should choose what you're most interested in what you're passionate about do, do that worry about the accounting later great thank you and moving on then that's I like the end this of my <laughs> Thank you. Um, so next up is kind of to get a better idea of what you do daily is what does a day in your life look like nowadays? Well, a day in my life, you don't want to know. I get up in curly um, and go to the gym usually about half past four. <laughs> you probably don't want wow. to hear that. I train. I'm a quite a serious runner and I do a lot of training. I typically get in the off pretty early uh, after that, maybe half past six. Um, at the moment, I mean, it's, I'm traveling and trying to avoid the crash because of the COVID situation. Um, I will then, you know, I'll typically be in the office till about half three, something like that. So I start early and finish early. Now, my days at the moment, I mean, I, have, I do not have a routine accounting job right now. My job uh, here at Huawei is really I'm studying, uh, I spent most of the year studying strategy and business model in autonomous cars, which is a field that Huawei is getting very big in. I mean, the Chinese market in autonomous cars is enormous. Uh, and Huawei is a big part of that. We're providing a lot of the technology for all cars and we're selling that technology to the uh, car makers. Um, and so what does that say? What I've been doing most of this year is studying business and strategies and helping management formulate how they're going to approach the market. Then um, the other project I've been working on is all about digitization. And a lot of that is about artificial intelligence. 
and so I'm spending a lot of time on a day job. And there, what I'm really thinking about is what are the new, well, they call them use cases. What are the new use cases for AI? So what we're trying to do is we're trying to create new applications for artificial intelligence that the company can then use and you know benefit from. So it's really as native imaginative thing because a lot, you know, if you're creating a use case, it basically means nobody's thought about it before and you have to figure out a way to apply AI for the first time to something. You know, one, I mentioned the, I'm, I'm going to build this AI driven forecasting model. It's actually for revenue in the smart car sector. Um, I'm fairly sure that model does not exist right now. So actually what we, we might be able to do after we've built it, it's quite, it's quite, it's, it's exciting. It's right at the top of stuff. So yeah, it's interesting. Amazing, so thank you. And then it's, it's not a tip accountant, I would say. <laughs> yes, no, it sounds very interesting indeed. And so again, pairing two questions together, there's some questions about how hard is it to find a job in accounting and is it a job that's in high demand? Um, it's, it's, in terms of getting a job, I would say uh, if, if you are a qualified accountant, it's, it's relatively easy to get a job. I mean, there are, there are, there's always demand for accountants. I mean, everybody, all companies need accounts, individuals need accountants for their tax affairs. Um, so it, and the reason I went into it was from a job security because once you've got that county qualification, it gives you a lot of job security. And yes, there is a high mm -hmm. demand. And it's funny, actually, in this country, we probably have more accountants per head of pop than almost any country in the world. I don't know why that is, but I think it's true. Uh, uh, but it is, uh, yeah, it's a great qualification. And I think a business qualification, even if you don't stay as an accountant, you can go off and do other things about how figures work, the company numbers are put together in a good position yeah yeah amazing and then next up a quick one is your job generally quite collaborative collaborative yeah was the question yeah uh, yes. very much yeah. yeah i mean the we have small teams um in my current job and yeah you typically um two or three people on a particular project working very closely together I'm, as the te technical director, I'm also overseeing projects in, in my team. So we'll have uh, one or two meetings a week where I'm looking at all, all the projects going. So yeah, there's a high degree of patience and um, you're certainly never on your own uh, in, in my current job. And I would say generally that's the case in any mm. accounting job. You're always, you know, you're always gonna be uh, uh, asking questions, trying to understand what is going on. I remember my very first day when I turned up at KPMG and my, my, this boss, Flint, who went on to become chairman of HSBC and saying, you know, if you don't understand what you're doing, keep asking people until you do. Um, and, and so there's always that, there's never such a thing as a bad question or a silly question. You can keep asking, asking, asking is fine. And I think in that sense, is a lot of collaboration should always go on, especially when you're starting out in your career. Mm. Yeah, great answer. Thank you. And we've got so many questions coming in, but we're just not going to have time to answer them all. So I think we'll use this as our last question, I'm afraid. But what would you say are the best and worst things about working in accountancy? The best in accountancy. I, to me, the best thing is being seeing the world. Uh, you know, I really have traveled the world with accounting. I met so many people, teachers, um, experienced countries. It's been, you know, in that respect, very, very rich experience. I don't mean in money, I just mean in terms of the meeting people, experiencing different cultures. So it's just been an amazing passport to the world. Um, uh, just on the fact that we, you know, we maybe there's more, I mean, people should feel free to connect on LinkedIn if they're on LinkedIn. And um, I'll I'll try and, you know, if people have particular questions, I can try and take them offline. 
Oh, that would be amazing. Thank you so much. Well, that will be a wrap on today's session. So thank you for all your questions, some great ones in there. And thank you so much to Hugh Shields for taking time to be here today. We really appreciate it. And just a reminder, don't forget to get all your work submitted and get the programme completed by November 12th to be eligible for your certificate. You can find all the important dates that you need on module one if you do need reminding. Good luck with the rest of your programme and we'll see you again very soon. Thanks.